warning. This episode contains strong language. You would you wouldn't have to even stay to work that uh, I, I don't know your term might be a work that sucks, where you, something where you don't like it. You would that, that's most of America, qualify. by the way. No, <laughs> just, I, I don't so believe you know. that. I think I think we Ooh. need jobs. I've, I've no, no, people. I'm saying people work jobs they don't like. That is most of America. I, I don't know about that. Is I don't a lot believe, of America. I don't agree with that. I talk to guys that every day are out like I was at AT&T, a, a lineman, out doing things, and they it gets them out of their house and they get to do things. And police officers find great uh, military guys. I, I agree with that, but I'm not talking about police officers. I'm talking about retail. Uh, you know, right? Retail workers, uh, service well, industry, right? Hospitality hey, hey. industry that makes up a huge part of the industry. Truck drivers, right? These people, they they have pride and respect. Yet they're probably not telling you the same thing they would tell me over a beer. No offense. Well, um, I, I I'm willing to accept that, but my point is, what if they want to do nothing. No, no, no. Of course not. People just so in a growing don't, don't economy, like the two you have attached. other chances. And that's I just don't think the two should the be attached. I just, again, I just don't think the two should be attached. Uh, I think you should have freedom to do your job and not have to worry about, can, can I live if I have this job? Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Boom. All right, let's get to it. So real quick, my guest today is Pete Sessions. Just heard the clip, just heard him talking, and now you're going to get to hear the whole interview. Uh, full disclosure, I also had Rick Kennedy on, who is the Democratic nominee. So Pete is the Republican nominee. Uh, in the 17th district, um, that congressional race is happening right now. The election's the same as the presidential one on November 3rd. And uh, yeah, they're fighting for that seat. Um, so Pete Sessions and Rick Kennedy. So this episode will be with Pete. And then the one after will be with Rick. I got them both on the podcast so we could hear from both of the candidates. And if you're in that district and you listen to the podcast and you haven't made a decision, maybe this will help you. These were really just, you know, sitting in a bar having beer kind of conversations well sort of look i'm gonna be honest okay with pete it was a little more um with mr sessions sorry i shouldn't be so disrespectful with mr sessions it was a little more i don't, I don't know what the word to say is by the book um you know almost like a cnn telecast of, of some sort um which we did have a conversation but it, it was just a little different um than the one i had with rick so, and, you know, maybe because Rick's not a career politician, it was just more down to earth, you know, two dudes talking, uh, you know, about the issues. It's great. I loved it. Um, and, and I did enjoy talking to Pete, which this episode is, but it was just different. You know, Pete comes from a long history, a long family of uh, being in politics. His father was the uh, director of the FBI under George Bush Sr. And, and Bill Clinton. Um, and Pete himself has been in Congress, was in Congress for 20 something years up there in North Texas, you know, parts of all kinds of committees and, and you know, long history of being in politics himself. Now he's moved districts and now he's running in another district against uh, Rick Kennedy here. So uh, yeah, just a di different conversations between the two people. So, you know, I guess that I'll just leave that to you to, to decide. But uh, I suggest listening to both episodes. So this one and then the next one with Rick Kennedy. Um, and yeah, they're interesting. Um, look, I'm just always going to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm a registered Democrat. I consider myself pretty liberal. And, you know, I bring people onto the podcast. It doesn't matter their political affiliation, right? The podcast doesn't have an affiliation. I might, but I'm not the only one that works at the podcast. Okay, there's lots of people that work with the podcast. So even though I might have a certain belief, doesn't mean everyone here does. So I respect that. And we have everyone on the podcast from all kinds, you know, different sides. So um, as you know, I'm more than willing to talk to a conservative. Um, it, don't, it doesn't matter to me. It's just like talking to people. So, but this particular person is, that's their job is to be conservative, right? Like, 
that he's a politician. So we get into politics and he's running in a current race. So it's a little bit different than, say, for instance, when I talked to Connie um, Burton, who was a former senator and really had no plans of going back into public office, at least not not at that point in time. But Pete is actively uh, going after it, right? So different conversation. Um, you know, we disagree on a lot of things. What, what am I going to say? Uh, but he was willing to talk and he was willing to answer questions and he was even willing to come back on and, and do more questions. So I did respect that. I, I will say that. Um, what I did think was kind of funny, again, just being honest, uh, you'll notice like right off the bat, you know, my first question is just kind of like, hey, how you doing? And then it just like, you know, uh, 10 minutes. And I think he mentioned Hunter Biden's emails in there, right? Right off the bat. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Nothing against you, uh, Mr. Sessions. I just thought that was kind of interesting um, that some of those answers were like that, where it's just a simple question and just kind of went off on a, but I mean, I guess that's the politics coming out because he did loosen up as we went with the podcast and maybe he just thought this is going to be like other interviews and, 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 you know, to his credit, how did he know, you know, how it was going to be? So, uh, but again, he was open. He was honest. He was willing to talk to me again. I didn't agree with him on everything. Um, don't agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, to be honest with you, we just have different beliefs. It's just that simple. Do I think he's a bad guy? Absolutely not. I just wouldn't, I personally wouldn't vote for him. Um, but it was great podcast. Uh, absolutely worth listening to. And look, if you're undecided, you don't know, and you live in that district again, in, you know, maybe this will help you decide. But I, I, I definitely would recommend listening to both. Okay, so listen to both podcasts. So, okay, let's get to it. All right. So, Mr. Pete Sessions, okay? And don't forget, check out our website, thelonestarplate.com, for everything you need to know about this podcast, okay? Pretty simple. So, let's get to it. Mr. Pete Sessions. Thank you so much, uh, Pete, for, for joining us today. Re really appreciate you taking the time today. Well, it's important that we, at a time when there is not only so much at risk in the country, it's important to talk about the peace parts, about how those fit together, whether it is a Senate race that will ultimately determine so many things that happen in the Senate, including the majority, or whether it is that makeup of the House, whether it would be Nancy Pelosi or whether we will seek a new direction. Republicans are seeking a new direction. So my ability to uh, not only to analyze, but to bring forth the voters, those differences between not just the candidates, but actually the parties. I will tell you, I think that both candidates are representatives of those party, but not in whole. I don't think that Joe Biden can stand up and say that he's in sync with, for instance, the Senate, even though he served as a member of that body for maybe 29 or 30 years, or that he could say he's in sync with the House. But the bottom line is, as president, he will follow that dictate and he will lead that. The same might be true of President Trump. President Trump needs, wants and needs a conservative or a Republican conservative Congress to match his ideas as we had done, for instance, with the tax bill. It would have been easy to say, we'll just barely, barely scratch the surface and give those uh, middle class workers and those those small businesses the opportunity to grow, but in fact he opened up. We opened up the entire uh, free enterprise system so that manufacturers and and big business, uh, including uh, those those people in the airline industry, and and that includes rent cars, hotels, everybody. Uh, was participatory in that. So all boats rose. And that's why we had such a great economy. And it will come back because the fight is not about the taxes or the tax structure, rules and regulations. It's now about overcoming COVID. And so that's why each of these peace parts matter. Yeah, 
Great. Wow. Great intro. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, Pete, you know, just, just jumping on this, it's a little bit different than where I was going to start it, but you know, this is what I love about podcasts. We can just go with the conversation. Um, what, what do you think is the biggest thing that voters are most concerned about right now? Do you, do you think it's COVID? In my opinion, the most important number one issue that people have actually is the direction of the country. There are many, many, many families, whether you're a husband or a wife and you have children or whether your children are in college or whether you're, you have seniors uh, that your parents or whether you are a senior and looking at the, the changing of rule of law and what is permissible uh, in our society and in the legality, I think to put it another way, it is Portland. I think it's the things that we saw in Minneapolis. I think the, the things that we see in Wisconsin is the things we see in California. Open thievery and theft, total disregard for not only rule of law, but police officers who many times show up because they're asked to come into, <laughs> excuse me, a dangerous circumstance and outright disrespect for the flag of the United States of America based upon some political spectrum as if our entire country uh, is, is, is as they see it as racist. That's not true because it is people that make up America. It is not the government. And too many times there are people who subscribe to government as what we stand for. And government does not. It is the people. It is the process. It is Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. Article 1 is the legislature. Article 2 is the executive branch. Article 3 is the court system. These are all balances of each other. And for them to attack all three systems, which is what this is about, the courthouse, the federal courthouse, is Article 3 in Portland, and they want to burn it to the ground. Total disregard by local people for the respect of, of a republic, the kind of, of, of system that we have. And uh, they're, they're, they're pushing a button that I think all Americans are afraid of because who is safe if we do not have the discipline of rule of law, when are we going to stop at stop signs and, and red lights and, and what can you get away with and open thievery? I watched a couple of weeks ago and it's, of course, it's all over the country, I assume, uh, because we've seen a number of them in Atlanta in where an Amazon truck pulls up to make a delivery and 50 people come out and rob it and take everything in it and hold the driver at bay. This is something that you see in a socialist country uh, like Venezuela or somewhere like that. And, and I think that's the number one issue. Okay, interesting. Um, wh what do you think about, like, you, you know, you mentioned those cities, Portland, and right, these things. What, what do you think they're... Okay, let me start this again. So I, I definitely agree with the violence and, you know, small, look, I'm a small business owner from Texas for a long time. Uh, so I definitely agree with, you know, protecting your small business and the violence. But how do you feel about the protest that initiated, right? Like, are you supporting of that, just not the violent part of it? I'm just curious. Well, I think it's important for, for you to know I'm a lifelong Texan. Uh, I grew up in Waco, Texas, where we had... Uh, what I would say uh, character uh, traits about living in a small town. I grew up throwing a paper route. I grew up with uh, men and women uh, on my paper route, uh, some who were not many, but a couple who were African-American. I came in contact through my parents. Uh, you'll recall my dad was federal judge. Yeah. Uh, U.S. attorney, a federal judge, FBI director. My dad sat on the Dr. Martin Luther King uh, uh, memorial uh, oh, wow. uh, 
uh, his his uh, the organization that talks about the respect of rule of law, not judging a person based upon their color of their skin, but the content. And my dad is, has been the most, the strongest influence in my life. So I grew up with that. I think there's a balance to it. He was also FBI director. I come from a law enforcement family. I come from seeing the men and women of the secret service and the FBI and the border patrol. They are there for our best interest to serve the American people. And so then I look at what I see is outwardly political signs of people who, for instance, in, in some of our cities, changed the name of great schools once they found out it was subscribed to or, or found out because most of the time people didn't know maybe what these schools not were named after because they didn't stand for that. And they cities would spend millions of dollars changing the names of these and changing the character where what needed to be done is the education inside and use that as part of our history to teach people. It had been good enough for a hundred years. So it then took a political stand that I think is not what the movement should be about. So do I support the right of people to come out and peacefully gather and make their point? Yes. And I think they could have, but they armed it with a political branch that was aimed to divide people. So I hate to see that. I am opposed to anyone who would use race uh, or the pretension of race in law enforcement as a justification. As a matter of fact, I helped lead and was a part of trying to make sure that my party, the Republican Party, did just like what we did in Texas to let people who we believe had served their time uh, essentially around eight years to get out of prison. And and this was done in, in the federal context. And I was a part of that as chairman of the House Rules Committee. I think that said volumes about what the Republican Party felt like about people who had committed crimes but would be able to then get out. Once again, I'll use the term in their lifetime. Uh, They paid their price. They served their time. They got out. And I think that says more about the Republican Party than than the comments that come from uh, highly partisan people who want to use race as the bait for that. And I, I, I'm disappointed. And I think that the essence of what the Dr. Martin Luther King uh, 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 Memorial, and it's not the memorial for him, it is the organization, uh, the committee that was made up of African-American uh, people who were business leaders, people who were government leaders, came together for the right reason that my dad was a part of this commission to make sure that that we did understand fairness and equal opportunity. And I have no doubt in my mind there's still disparities. And I think we've not talked about the disparities. And we need to talk about the disparities. And I think that's what I tried to do when we passed the tax bill. That's why there are more African-Americans working or were uh, in our country in the history and more Hispanics and more women and more people. I also am the father of a disabled uh, son, a Down syndrome young man. And I know that the many times the first people that lose their job are those that are disabled. So I think the rights of disabled and the rights of what might be uh, African-Americans or Hispanics or anyone that might have a difference necessarily about them uh, I, I I don't I don't appreciate people taking advantage of them because I've seen it firsthand and people learn and then they learn and they're not embarrassed they're not or they're not ashamed they're embarrassed and they correct their behavior and I think that's the story that would be told about America and it is true of our Republican Party we care about people but we're willing to learn along the way but there has to also be in my opinion instead of going to violence and criminality, 
and talents of racism or dis disapproval. Let's go to resolution. So that's what I think, Patrick. Yeah, I can, uh, I can definitely agree with, um, you know, trying to come to a resolution and definitely anti-violence uh, for sure. Um, you know, uh, definitely a lot of law enforcement in my family as well and military um, as well. Um, I probably have a different outlook and I'm a little bit of a black sheep in my family in, in that sense politically. Um, but that's OK. Um, you know, this is what I love about this podcast is just having open conversations and being able to uh, try to understand where someone is coming from and sort of why they think the, you know, the way they think. Um, so let, let's move a little bit quickly because, you know, uh, Mr. Sessions, I'm very interested in this move that you've made to this new district. First of all, I love Waco. I'm, you know, I'm from Texas as well. Great city. A lot of my great friends come from there. I've spent actually a lot of time at Waco. I really like the town a lot. Um, so I'm curious why, I mean, I know you're from there. Is that the whole reason of why going to, you know, make this move, uh, to this particular place is you were in Dallas for, you know, for so long, which is, which is coincidentally where I grew up. I grew up in Dallas. Well, uh, let's, let's, let's delve all the way into that. Any question you've got, I certainly am very open to discussing. Sure. Uh, the bottom line is I was uh, retired and, and off on my, uh, things. Uh, I, I spent a good bit of time, uh, business development, uh, traveling, uh, being with, uh, uh, a number of people who were trying to increase not only America's trade with the world, but to, to, to build and establish new businesses and employ people. And uh, literally October of last year, I received a call from what was first one and then two and then three county chairmen who recognized that the open seat here was not necessarily being filled that they could see. Uh, by someone who they uh, would have confidence in, including the viewpoint that perhaps uh, uh, politically uh, there might be some difficulty in holding this seat as a, what I would say, a conservative Republican seat. And so the, these three county chairmen uh, talked to me, asked me to uh, move down here, the uh, McLennan County Chairman, John Carr, uh, openly said that uh, he would call this manna from heaven, getting an experienced person who not only had the uh, understanding about politics, but representation. So I had previously served for eight years in uh, about 40% of the district. Uh, each month I was in for eight years was in every single one of those counties in representation. I knew people, had dear friends, they still know me. Uh, and then you add in what was uh, easily another 40% of the congressional district. And all of a sudden we're at about 80% of the congressional district, uh, maybe slightly less that I knew and knew well. I grew up in Waco threw a paper route here, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, <laughs> seventh grade, eighth grade, got my Eagle Scout award here. Uh, my dad sat on the city council here. Our family uh, has attended Baylor University for generations, although I attended and my brothers attended Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas, which uh, is not in this district, but it's just immediately north, about 15 yeah. miles. Very so cool. I have this strong affinity, but the interesting parts uh, to these people that asked me to do it was that during the period of time, the, my first eight years in Congress that I served, I developed this expertise in farm and ranch policy. I developed this expertise in small communities and the development of the energy issue of oil and natural gas uh, and certainly the electricity industry because that is where so many of these plants are. And Leon County used to be part of the boom and of the uh, nat gas, natural gas boom. So I have this affinity, but what I did is I developed the ability to have a 100% uh, record with the Texas Farm Bureau and a 100% record with the National Rifle Association and a 100% uh, values, what I consider to be a values uh, interest in, in 
what might be called uh, pro-life. And these are all v- issues that are vitally not just important to me, but I believe represent the values of, of the vast majority of this congressional district. And so it became a fit then. So I will go back as a 22-year member, then a 23-year member, will be a senior member of the Financial Services Committee, which is where all my jurisdiction is, will be uh, able to effectively represent what I think is going to be one of the most important issues, and that is how we're going to deal with these trillions of dollars that were given out uh, and allocated that you and I both know over time the rules have changed and how we're going to make a determination about who pays money back and what that might be. Uh, And so I will be in that committee of jurisdiction. I also have a strong content uh, because of the Texas Farm Bureau where I will go back and help make sure that the Texas Farm Bureau and the communities and the farmers and ranchers uh, are well represented. I understand, which not a lot of people did, I don't think any of my other colleagues did, that one in three acreage was devoted to uh, making sure we we pass these things during trade deals overseas. One in three cattle, one in three sheep, one in three pigs. And it is up to us to make sure that our trade which is a backbone of of us growing our economy in these cities that might be lost otherwise if we did not employ trade. So I became a strong advocate. You saw in this campaign where uh, the relationships that we have with other countries, uh, people wanted to say they were terrible and we should back out. But what would be left in the balance is Texas 17, our communities contribute. Uh, Texas Farm Bureau will tell you $17.7 billion worth of produce is produced by Texas in these trade deals. And so they needed a voice. And, yeah. and, and yet, as you know, there are strong content and ideas that deal with my background. I was on the original Bell Labs team with AT&T, where we developed broadband. And I have an understanding of of the internet and the law surrounding uh, 5G uh, and, and, and internet usage. So I, there, there's a lot of what I think are uh, overlapping issues. I, I call this a Venn diagram where I share so many of the strong ideas and contents and principles uh, with the district uh, and, and not shy about it. That's why I'm 100% with the Texas Farm Bureau. I'm 100% with the National Rifle Association. I'm 100% behind our military and have told people openly, when we have extra money, we need to give it to our military. And lastly, law enforcement, that I will be behind our law enforcement officers and they will make the, the, the have the discussion when something does not go right. But I don't think you can partially be behind our military or 90% be behind our law enforcement. I think you ought to stand behind them because they got a tough job. So these yeah. are the things that I think uh, brought, brought me to the district where I'm a great, great matchup. And I think we're finding that in the first election uh, in March, I uh, took 32%, won uh, 10 of 12 counties uh, and did the same uh, in the runoff, won 10 of 12 counties because uh, people do have, uh, I think, an understanding of what Pete Sessions stands for, what the Republican Party stands for, and that my relationship with them will be that I will see them every single month, every uh, time I will make myself available in these uh, particular counties to make sure that I represent them. Oh, that's amazing. Well, that's great. I'm sure, you know, you get to go back to the hometown, and um, I'm sure that's an amazing feeling. Um uh, you know, I, th- this is something I'm curious about, um, Pete. So look, uh, you know, just full disclosure, I, I actually, you know, I voted for Biden and Harris in this election. I've already voted. I'm happy to say it. Um, what what would you say to someone who hasn't voted yet, but it may be leaning towards Biden and Harris? What would you say to them? Why would you want to change their vote? What would you say to them? You know, no, you know, your, your vote would better be suited for Donald Trump and and uh you know, Vice President Mike Pence. I'm curious, what what were your 
your well, argument for that being? Well, it's really, it's really pretty uh, principled to me, and that is I'm an American, and I grew up as a Texan, and I grew up under a, a set of laws and a constitution and uh, ways to deal with people that I think were fair that we could count on. I think things are resolved at a courthouse. I think they're resolved with, uh, with our peers making decisions for us in a rule of law. I think that there are laws that must be followed and it can't be something where some group of people get away with something and others don't. Uh, I think this is about the direction of the country and I am very concerned. I think President Trump in some respects has less to do with it or, or Vice President Biden and more to the direction of the philosophy and the philosophy openly of the uh, Democratic Party is they are now beholden, uh, in my opinion, completely to the left. And you've got California, you've got Oregon, you've got Washington, you've got other places where elected officials do not uphold the rule of law. And I think rule of law, once you get away from that, you have chaos. And what they describe next is circumstances because they're the ones that openly call themselves socialists. Uh, the woman running for mayor of Portland, uh, socialist or communist. She has communist dictators on the dress that she wears. That is the model. And these places that I have seen in my experience, uh, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Cuba, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, they are not economic powers. They are, they are crush. They crush people who get in their way and they selectively choose who is and who is not prosecuted. And that's exactly what is going on uh, around the country uh, where these people politically decide what is okay and what is not, and then want the federal government to pay for it. So We've for long, a long time had political differences. We, we have always had that in our country, and they are resolved through rule of law, not through individual dictate about how someone would respond. Secondly, I think that there's no doubt in my mind away from that, and that is to the candidates, uh, that, that this viewpoint of COVID uh, a blaming President Trump is simply a, an embarrassment for anyone who would do that. This is something that we forecast and we knew would be in our future years ago when uh, I, as a young Republican, began the process to fund NIH uh, and the government process for uh, understanding the Genome Project. Dr. Francis Collins, who is a very, very dear friend of mine, was the leader of that and now serves as the head of the National Institute of Health. Uh, Tony Fauci, head of infectious diseases, a very dear friend of mine who we have listened to and we support. Uh, and, and then as this politically uh, came forth, it reminded me of what happened with President Bush, uh, George W. on 9-11. Everybody was for protecting our country and doing those things. And then politically, it turned against the president as he prosecuted the war, as he held people accountable. And the other side did not like that. They did not like that the answer was that we would send our military to protect this country. I guess they wanted social workers or nothing at all. And the overwhelming evidence was we went in and cleared out the wasp nests and the snakes. And it did come uh, at, a, at a heavy toll, not only to our United States military and families, but the men and women. But I think to a person, I've heard families over and over again, respect and appreciate their service and duty to this country. Well, the same thing is happening now. It's a collision of political science and a collision with a public uh, health science. And the public health science, uh, I don't think, is actually known. We had heard, well, when we get to June and July, this virus will be whipped. We'll get it. Well, that came directly from the mouths of microbiologists who openly said that. And, and yet, likely, 
the, the answer from New York, Governor Cuomo, you remember he's no longer on the national stage because his political instincts, not healthcare instincts, political instincts led the nation and these people being killed by staying in place rather than opening themselves up. So my son, who was a second year uh, a hospitalist, he's a second year in, uh, resident, told me in March, he said, Dad, this disease, this virus mutates or moves so fast that probably everybody is going to end up getting it. But the people who it will attack are those people with the, the term comorbidities. And those are the people who are always the weakest in society. But uh, he's also found a way over time as the country has to, to, to turn the corner. So you remember the, uh, the ship USS Hope sailed and went to New York City. It was never even really used. All those beds were not needed. New York City put together these huge areas, spent millions of dollars to be prepared for all these people. They were taken down within weeks. Houston, Texas uh, did the same thing. So the media still wants to make it seem like all these people are infected, all these problems abound. Well, our healthcare system and, and pharmaceutical industry is hard at work developing. And in, at this time, we have going on these live trials that are going to produce the answer. But this is not one of those socialist countries that came out within weeks and said, we've got the answer. China said they had the answer. Russia said they had the answer. Well, maybe they do. But we've said, we've got a process. We're not going to cut the corners. We're going to do the right thing. And professionals uh, uh, have still stayed on duty in doing that. So do you hold Donald Trump accountable? Yeah, I think in some regards you do. And, and that is to say, he worked very diligently to make sure and recognize early on we need to take care of our country. And, and some $3 trillion was spent. And $3 trillion is, is, is an, 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 it's, an, it's a very large amount. But the president took the responsibility and did that. But he wasn't going to add the money in to pay for the damage uh, of almost a billion dollars that, that these other cities have allowed, open, openly allowed. And when you mix political science and sound science and then realities, I think Donald Trump more or just as equally my Republican Party. I think my Republican Party is not into giving away everything that we have, because the next generation, five years from now or less, they will need a, a country that effectively works, that people can understand what their rights are. And Patrick, I would say to you, I don't think you have any clue to the, the power of the left and the power of what they're willing to do in our good name, the United States of America, to indebt us forever, to, to not protect us completely and to give advice about staying at home and covering up with your mask and making it a federal crime. That means the FBI would be out arresting people for not wearing a mask. And, and it should be something that is a local law to where people have that ability, whether you're in Portland or Seattle or Dallas, Texas or Waco, Texas, to make those determinations of local issues. And they want to federalize everything. And I think that is not only unwise, I, I would hope that we never go that direction. But this is what the socialists and the leftists in Washington want. They want to control the goods and services of this country. And I can tell you on the healthcare debate, uh, our answer, which we're never given credit for, the Republican Party wants to move everybody up to employer-provided health care, not down to Medicare for all uh, or Obamacare that reimburses the health care system providers 50% less. And that's why uh, you can't find a doctor for your parents who are on Medicare. There are fewer and fewer doctors 
because they can't survive at 50% less and still provide leading edge services. So the, these ideas that wander the left uh, about all these ways to fix things still come down to a national standard, a national policy that will not only ruin our country, but will take us places, Patrick, that you have not even heard of. I, I have heard of these because I am, am in the, was in the Congress for 22 years and saw this happening. And just as the Republican Party went through a change with our addition of what we called our Tea Party uh, and Freedom Caucus now, the left is going through this where the left now controls every senator and each of the, the, the people in, in, in Congress that are, are, are Democrats. And that's why you saw uh, the, the terrible decision that was made all year last year to get the president on, on uh, impeachment when in fact, not only did it not stand a chance but many of the facts that were purported, we're now finding out the FBI had information that might have questioned some of that. So I, I would say to anybody that is left doubting, I would go to a basic understand of what direction do the parties stand for. My Republican Party is, is pro-business. They are pro-people. They're pro-law enforcement. They're pro-you being... Uh, having freedom and opportunity. So uh, it's, a, it's not, a, not a hard argument for me, but there are hundreds of ways to look at it uh, where, where we completely disagree. Sure, absolutely. Look, I'm, I live in Texas and I'm a liberal Democrat. Uh, so I've grown up my whole life uh, being able to talk to people who think differently than me. And I, honestly, more than half my friends are conservative and Republican. Um, to be honest with you, it's not even what we bring up when we hang out or, or talk. Um, Patrick, you I, and I are having a conversation that I, is I mean, reality of based. Of course. Of course. Yeah. This is what I do all day. Um, that doesn't ever bother me. What somebody's uh, affiliation is uh, religion. That, that, none of that bothers me. Just who you are as a person and yes, how sir. you treat and how you treat me. Right. And, and if you talk to me respectfully, boom, I'm in, I'll talk about anything to be honest with you. Yeah. I, that's well, how you for, learn. For, inst for instance, um, some of the discussion that takes place. So many people in politics have just now arrived here on, on, to my conservatives and on the left. Uh, they really have no real understanding of uh, what I would call history. For instance, my eighth year as a member of Congress, uh, I, it was based upon President Bush, my Down syndrome son, Alex, said to President Bush, thank you for helping my dad pass the legislation. And Alex is a very thoughtful young man, but at eight years old, did not understand the full context. President Bush found out about the bill, took time to find out about the bill and called Speaker Hastert and said, this thing has been there for eight years. I want it. The next, next piece of legislation is going to pass. And here's what it did. It allows a family that is above the Medicaid level, in other words, a family that is, is in Medicaid, they qualify for things that help. Uh, and if you're a dollar above that, that line, you don't qualify. And so what this said is the Family Opportunity Act, known as the Dylan C. James Act, said that where you have a medically disabled or distressed child, where a family is above the Medicaid level, we will allow to four times the Medicaid level, that family to be able to use on their basis for that one child, not the whole family, we, you, we will allow them to be in Medicaid on a sliding scale basis. So here's what I learned as a first year member of Congress. First, I learned to open up my own mail. I didn't let somebody else do that. It always came to me. I learned that where, and partially because I had a Down syndrome son and Alex was lucky, both his parents worked, but where you have a disabled child, many times one of the parents has to quit work yeah. because they have to go to the hospital. They have yeah. to be there as an advocate, but yes, but also out of love of their child. 
Sure. But where this happens, it means that many times the family income is cut substantially. And so what happened is, is that Dylan C. James was a part of a family where his, he was a Down syndrome young man. His mom quit work, was with him in Dallas uh, the, in, the entire time through 13 surgeries. Well, dad, because he needed it and the family needed it, took a $700 payment as a bonus from the year before because he went to work every day and did a good job. Because of that $700 payment, it knocked them out of receiving Medicaid. So the family got in touch with me. I read the letter. I made the call. This is before social media. I called down and and spoke with uh, Governor Bush's staff, uh, uh, a guy whose name is Wren Archer, Dr. Wren Archer. And Dr. Wren Archer was son of Bill Archer. Bill Archer and I share birthdays, March 22nd with each other. And I got to develop a, a relationship with a senior member of Congress, probably off goodwill to each other. But his son took my call. He didn't avoid it. And he worked to get this family through a circumstance. So What's the policy result? The policy result is there were some, at minimum, 5,000 families a year in the country that would have to give their child up to a foster parent, which means the government, the state, local government, the, federal, the state government would spend about $60,000 to get somebody to take care of somebody else's baby, even though they wanted, and then use the same system that they could have been given by qualifying. So this Family Opportunity Act is one of the basics that we have. Well, so is pre-existing condition. And, and yet, if you listen to current content, oh, Republicans are opposed to pre-existing conditions. That is a huge mistake to pitch that as a political issue because it makes, it's an insensitive comment it's as insensitive as a racial comment of describing someone in a way that is not truthful. And as the father of Alex and doing this legislation, I quite honestly, instead of being resentful, I say to people, you're not knowledgeable. You don't really know what you're talking about. And so please, if you do not know what you're talking about, whoops, what happens is it's a political hit. So all of a sudden in politics, these new people think everything is a fair game. They think calling somebody a racist or calling someone who's Republicans or against preexisting conditions, that, that's, that is a, an unfair and unwise and a hurtful thing. And it's not okay. So Go back. But that kind of happens business. on both sides, though, right? That oh, I, I fully sides. admit that. I think I said yeah. our new people on the right. But I would also say to you, Patrick, that the things that, quote, new people in conservative circle, they do accuse the left of, but they're guilty of it. Rule of law. They openly in, in, in Ohio, in Oregon, that... They will be arrested properly by their own people and let go. Uh, they openly are for moving our country to uh, uh, Medicare for all. Medicare for all, if you read it, it outlaws any private use being reimbursed for any health care services from dentistry to mental health to any surgery. That is that is more than a government-run system. That outlaws anyone else. So I don't see where what we're saying is not truthful. I think that what the right claims the left is, is uh, truthful. So tell, tell me one that would not be truthful like the three that I've told you about us being racist or us being against uh, pre-existing conditions or us being against people of color. Please tell me anything when my party has come and let people out of out of jail who served, we didn't say uh, if you're white or black or Hispanic, we said you served. And I, I think my party and I think I in particular as a representative, as a senior member of our party, 
I, I think it's disingenuous for us to say the things and the full content going on today. Why doesn't Biden Hunter say that was my laptop? He's allowing people to go out and question whether this is true or not. But the facts of the case are, you know, if you ask me something, I have a duty to respond. Even when I may not like it, I have to say that is not true or it's partially true or explain myself. And so what's happening is, is that the accusation is being met with silence on the other end and it's deafening silence, which then means that's fair game. If someone does not stand up and willing to correct something that is wrong. So Patrick, I'm willing to to tell you straight up, my party is not perfect. I'm not perfect, but I'm also willing to look at you and tell you that the things that we think and say and do are in the best interest long term for another 200 years for this country, including being prepared for the next COVID, being prepared for the next uh, hurricane and downturn. And, And as an Eagle Scout, I have an obligation to tell the truth and live by these things. And I think that scouting is another thing that is uh, becoming a casualty of this new new thing. And I think that scouting and telling the truth and being honest and helping other people and doing a good turn daily, well, I think that that should be admired, not not something that we would uh, want want to to turn away from. So. I I would not without look this your show. I'm not trying to challenge you, but I would I would certainly encourage anything that you believe my party is uh, doing that you do not believe is right. I mean, throw it at me, and I'll I'll try and offer something. But I will tell you, I think the reason why we need to return uh, Republicans in control of the House of Senate and presidency is the balance. Sure. Look, uh, you know, the, the honest truth is I, I wasn't ever even into politics before 2016. That, that is the honest truth. I, I could. I think, that's, care, I think that's what I said about less. most people. Yeah, yeah, I could care less about it. Just wasn't. And I don't know if that's good or bad as an American. I just was involved in another thing. My life just didn't. You know, I'm just a normal, everyday working American. Thank okay? goodness. That, that's the that's the honest truth. And And most people that I know, like we're all the same and we don't really like getting into politics and it's kind of a, yeah, it is a touchy subject and it does make things a little uncomfortable. Sometimes the truth is most people don't really like either side and don't really trust any politician. That's the honest truth. And it's, I I think you're right. And what happens is each side starts pointing the finger and we and the audience are going, uh, we're pointing the finger at both of y'all that that's how that's really the honest truth. And so you end up making a choice. Well, I want to pick one or the other, but I guess I'm just going to go off policy or if I like this person and everyone's got a different perspective. That's something I've learned. Look, uh, Pete, I've lived in three different countries. My mom's from Mexico City. I grew up in Mexico. My wife's from Spain. I'm a resident of Spain. So I lived in Spain for many years. We got married over there. Uh, My wife's actually in Spain right now, helping her family through COVID and and what's going on. And actually, her family has uh, Down syndrome. Her brother has Down syndrome as well. So they're actually dealing with a lot of the same issues you've dealt with. uh, You're you're no different than I am in the same boat in so many ways. But my point is, is that you said it. You're kind of new to this. And I do admit, I will be very open to admit that when you come to a fist fight or when you when you see an accident, you know you you do want to know what happened, and sometimes the participants in there both are equally guilty, and sure. and I I do I do think I have not done as good a job as I could do myself. Well, that's to, everybody. To defend, well, that's no, everybody. because I tended not to worry about that. You know, there's an old saying. And it's a problem. It's a Republican saying. And, and, and a guy named uh, Ronald Reagan made it famous. If you don't care about who gets credit, you know, you're OK. And, and I have tended not to try and get credit for me or my party over time. But we let the results speak for themselves. And I think the results that spoke for ourselves were evident with our economy until COVID. It, it, 
for so many reasons of bringing jobs back to America and standing up for America. And the problem is I do see where the other side can say, oh, you want America to be great and everybody else in 10th place. Well, I think when that 10th place became the Iranians or became the Russians or the Chinese or became people who are, are bitterly opposed to freedom for people, that became okay to me. But I still think that Republicans passed this new trade deal that made it great for following rules with Canada and great for following rules with Mexico. Mexico is our largest trading partner. We need to have a great relationship. And that you yes. know, Patrick, the, the Obama administration completely ignored them. And they will say that. That's why it completely ignored them. And, and that is why, uh, you know, it, it's, it, and, and now I will say uh, uh, the Trump administration, I think, can, can do and needs to do a better job, too. Mexico is not the problem. The Mexican people are not the problem. The problem is the people who take advantage of Mexico. Well, it's the government in Mexico. Um, and I've lived the with it my whole life. Uh, my, my uncle was actually a police officer in Mexico City for 30 years. Oh. Um, he was actually assistant to the chief of police. Um, a lot of history there. I, I used to go to a lot of police stations. I've flown in helicopters, tank, you name it. They used to pick me up from the airport like that when I was a kid in the eighties, full patrol showing up to pick me. I always felt super special. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot, look, I have, we could do a whole podcast about Mexico. It's a, a very special connection to me and the issues that, um, you know, Mexico has honestly are never really truly highlighted in, in America. It's always the relationship with Mexico, right? And that, we, that to me is a different conversation. Partner. Yeah, they're a large beautiful. trading partner. And I would encourage you to, to have the president of the U.S. Mexico Chamber, uh, uh, who is a Hispanic man, uh, Al Zapanta, General Al Zapanta, uh, on to, to talk about these things because I think the relationship is important. I've tried to be part of that to ensure it, it is good and getting better. So I think, awesome. I think you're in this thing, Patrick, for the right reason. I, I applaud you for doing this. Of course. Absolutely. Look, I, I always know I'm going to fundamentally disagree with pe a lot of people in my life. That, that's never my issue. My issue is finding what, what can I connect with them on? And to be honest with you, my, my biggest issue is just healthcare. That, that's just the biggest thing that Good, let's talk that, about that. that that is uh and i'll tell you why you know my father uh born in st louis served in the military in the air force i was actually b born in omaha because that's where he was stationed awesome. uh, and then we, then we moved to texas when i was six months old um my, my brother was actually born in mexico though uh because my mom's from mexico like i said and they met there in omaha um but my father was sick my whole life. Um, in fact, when I was born, my father had developed tongue cancer and he lost half his tongue. So when I was born, he only had half a tongue. Then he developed throat cancer and he had to have surgery. Then he was feeding himself through a tube right here. Then he got a brain tumor behind his left eye. It, it, it almost killed him when I was 14. Then it came back later on. Then he got acoustic neuroma in the ear, another tumor. Then he had prostate cancer. I could go on in my father's thing. And healthcare was such a big part of my life. It affected my life so much. And, and my father struggled so much to provide healthcare for himself. It was debilitating. And he even had to work in the worst moments of his life when he was in his final years, which killed me. He had to work so that he could have that healthcare. And that killed me. So when someone brings up healthcare to me, and it's a really touchy subject with me. And look, and again, I've lived in a country where they provide healthcare to you and the system is great. Now, it just perspective. If you've never lived in that system, you might think something differently. If you know, I think it's all perspective and experience, and you're going to have a different outlook on it based on that. That that's just the reality of it. So yes, I want healthcare to be provided to everyone, just like you can call a nine one one and a police officer can show up at your house to take care of you. You you should be able to you know your your healthcare should just not be something tied to an employer. I know too many people. I ran my own business. When you ask businesses to provide healthcare to people, that is a nightmare. Uh, it, it immediately ruins any small business that's from zero to 20, 30 employees. You're just like eliminating them. It makes it really hard for them. And so, again, so if, let, if you're an employee and you're tied to where you have to work, 
you can't switch jobs. I have so many friends that don't leave their job. They hate it, but the, the healthcare is good. That sucks to me. That's a horrible system. That, so, that's just so, my opinion. So, so good. So let's talk about this. So the answer by the Democratic Party was Obamacare. And I would like to describe to you in one minute the Republican answer that you do not know. The Republican Party was going to give every single American person that is legally in this country, not illegally, because we we're legal, we're legal, to give them three thousand dollars tax credit for every single adult and fifteen hundred for every single person seventeen and below, where they could buy an a, a policy that would be. Uh, like an employer based where you would be in a group plan and that group plan would allow you to have a lower deductible. And then you would be able to just like anybody else, if they were employed by a company, they would go in in October and they would purchase any of the varieties that they would choose to. And their company would provide probably on a 70-30 split that they would pay for the policy and you would pay except yours and theirs would be pre-tax, pre-tax. Small business does not get that. And so this would allow every single company, every single individual actually, to be able to come in and get a $3,000 or $9,000 for a family of four would give them $9,000 where they could go in just like what you did if you worked at, as I did for 16 years, AT&T, and purchase a group plan. You want to get an HSA, but it would give you that parity that people who work get. So if you didn't want to stay at your job and you wanted to be unemployed, you'd still get you and your wife $6,000. And the first 6,000, then you could get an HSA. Now it may cost you just as Obamacare does a couple hundred dollars a month, but you would have this. And the advantage is, is that you would be into a plan that reimbursed healthcare providers the same as it would as you worked at AT AT&T. Now, why would you move down when you could move up? But you see, the narrative, Patrick, is Republicans had no bill. Well, President Obama said that day after day, and so the second time I heard him say it, we shed, no, the world's greatest health care plan is exactly where our party is and the bill is available, Mr. President, you can't say that. Oh, by the way, pre-existing conditions and up to age 26 is in this bill also. But what is also in the bill is parity because see, this is where the democratic party is not for parity. They want poor people or people that are on their system to be on an individual policy not a group plan because they're still owned and controlled. Is it fair or not that I say this, but wholly owned subsidiary of the unions and the unions didn't want to give up what they had. So they had to say, well, you can't have what they've got. Well, the Republican party says you can have it. And every single person, every single person up to their Medicare eligible You may have this. And even with Medicare, you could go on this and get the money. I don't understand why, except it's bitter politics of who can control your life. So, Patrick, you now have, I said a minute, it's taking me four minutes. (laughs) We are for, the Republican Party is for every single person having a plan that is parity with pre-tax that gives you the money let you go on the same website that I would if I worked for the company and Blue Cross and Blue Shield and buy exactly and the first for a family, the first $9,000 that 
That's your contribution. And it's advanceable, and it is where you can get exactly what I've got, and your deductible is $1,000, probably $1,200 for a family, for an individual, $1,000. Forget all this Obamacare stuff, $7,000. I was on Obamacare for eight years. It is twice as expensive, and, and I never used my insurance. Everything was out of pocket because that's the way it's designed. It was not designed to help people like members of Congress, and the members of Congress are on it. So, Patrick, in fairness, you got to look at both sides. You just can't say... So with that said, what do you think about the Republican plan? Um, you know, I'll be honest. I, I think um, I don't know enough about health care to, to know what would be the correct plan. All I know is as a struggling American, as I'm one of so many, right, that, that decide these elections. And so you the know, struggle would go away. You would no. have the same, same or similar that I had at AT&T where you described where you go to work, you, would, you wouldn't have to even stay to work that, uh, uh, I, I don't know, your term might be a work that sucks, where you, something where you don't like it. You would that, That's most of America, qualify. by the way. No, <laughs> just, I, I don't so believe you know. that. I think, I think we Ooh. need jobs. I've, I've no, no, people, I'm saying people work jobs they don't like. That is most of America. I, I don't know about that is I don't a lot believe, of America. I don't agree with that. I talk to guys that every day are out like I was at AT&T, a, a lineman, out doing things, and they it gets them out of their house, and they get to do things, and police officers find great uh, military guys. I, I agree with that, but I'm not talking about police officers. I'm talking about retail uh, you know, right. Retail workers, uh, service yeah. industry, right. Hospitality hey, hey. industry that makes up a huge part of the industry. Truck drivers, right. These people, they, they have pride and respect. Yet they're probably not telling you the same thing they would tell me over a beer. No offense. Well, um, I, I I'm willing to accept that. But my point is do, what they want to do. Nothing. No, 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 of course not. People just so in a don't, growing don't economy, like the two you have attached. other chances. And that's I just where don't you got to grow the economy. Attached. I just, again, I just don't think the two should be attached. Uh, I think you should have freedom to do your job and not have and to worry not. about, can, can I live if I have this job? And I just saw and my father not. and my whole family do that my whole life. And it was absolutely destructive to our whole family. If my father had lived in another particular country that had health care provided for him, we wouldn't have had any of the struggles that we had growing up. And that, that bothers me a lot. You know, I don't, but, I don't know. You know. I, I know it bothers fairness, a lot of families. He, in, fa no. in fairness, he might not have survived the first one. He got the same care that his executive at AT and T would have gotten. So what I'm telling you is, I'd like for you to know that the Republican Party is for decoupling those two to where everybody gets it, and that's like when that. that's I when like we that. had John McCain. I'm I did this. And and we were sunk. Yeah, I so mean, look, get ready. Uh, yeah, I understand. Get ready. Uh, you're you're gonna you're gonna see it. But my point is, I I encourage you to to know both sides. Sure. And 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 That's I think you're gonna find that my my ideas that I'm aware of about where our party is are equally competitive or better then turn this into a socialist system. And I believe that. Yeah. No, look, uh, I, I've actually only had Republican politicians on the show and I'm a liberal. So see, look, I always give the other side a chance. I've actually had no liberal because I don't like talking to people that think exactly like I do, because then we're just parroting each other. I well, prefer I think to talk you should. to people. Oh, well, you got to challenge you your own ideas. It's important there, to there challenge your ideas, right? There, there, I've been very specific about my ideas. I you think have. you should go get uh, from your hometown uh, some members of Congress and ask them what they really do believe. Sure. And be Absolutely. and be specific. I, I, I think you ought to put uh, uh, other side on. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. And, and uh, tell well, them, we try. Uh, Pete Sessions. <laughs> Pete Sessions came on my show for a long time. And, and I, he was open about where he stands and, yeah, and no, be, be equally open. And I Absolutely. think, I think you will see a difference, sir. Absolutely.
No, I, I look, uh, Pete, I, I really appreciate your time. Again, I, I really appreciate you just being open and honest and willing to talk to me. Um, it's all starts there with a the conversation. If I can't have a conversation with somebody, where can, how can we go to step two? You know, well, so I, I want to do well enough also where you come to me in January and in February and in March <laughs> and April. And, and I'd like for you to pick uh, somebody or otherwise I'll pick them on the other side because it, it is where that party is, and I am where my party is. And uh, I, I quite honestly believe I've got to put you in where you know more about our party, just like, you know, I've learned lots of things about agriculture and about health care and about truck driving and about people who, who pick up trash and people who are volunteers and people who are, I mean, we have done disabled. it. <laughs> I've had those jobs uh, before. Um, so, yeah, for sure. We've actually had quite a few farmers on the show and ranch Good. owners. Uh, but we're sponsored by Texas Real Food, which is the biggest one of the biggest supporters in Texas of local ranches. I'm all about local food. I'm a chef. So I'm all about local food, uh, all about supporting local ranchers and farmers. So definitely happy to hear you say all those those sorts of things. I definitely get behind that uh, for sure. Well, I, I'm love, all about that. I love the farmer's market on uh, Saturday here in Waco. Uh, beautiful where, farmer's market it, out there i've been there i've been there it's awesome it's amazing it's a gorgeous gorgeous thing but li likewise so is also the history of waco sure and, and the stability of waco and the character of waco yeah. and you know i maybe maybe we're not perfect but i guarantee you uh <laughs> I, I prefer where we are to chaos yeah, well, I, I don't see it as chaos, but again, it's all just a matter of, of how we see it. And well, um, move, you know, move to Portland or move to Minneapolis or move to California and you're going to see chaos, my brother. I've lived in California. Um, I've, you know, I got friends in all those places. Um, again, I, yeah, just perspective. That's that's how I see it. Um, but I appreciate your perspective. I appreciate your outlook and your experience and, and everything you've, you've been through for sure. Um, and I definitely listen to everything. How many uh, people you said. Got, got shot in, in, in Chicago each of the last 52 weeks, 72 weeks. You know what that really is? It's a drug war. That's what that yeah. is. It's turf drug war. Sure. And it's because they decriminalize these things and, and it's a, it's wild west. And even the police, can't can't help save and many times the people who are victims are young people random sure. shots i agree and i just uh I, that's I, sad i agree well i think that's community I, their own community needs to come together and, and help themselves out a lot too well, i think that's a big do, part do, of it do you know who their police commissioner is uh no i, I don't know what uh you're talking about chicago i, I don't yes i don't david I brown don't David Brown. Do you know who David Brown is? No. Nope. He was the chief of police, Dallas Police Department, when they had those seven brave or nine brave officers who walked down the middle of the street where the police officers were killed. And he was the black police chief who got outed because of his response where uh, the perpetrator who, when cornered, still killed another police officer. And, and the, that was the horrific. Liberals, Horrific. The liberals in Dallas ran him out of town. Well, I don't know if it was just all liberals. I, I, I just, uh, that seems I just like a generalization. Fact, so you ought to have him on the show. Let oh, him talk course. about the lives of men and women and protecting oh. people. Of course. I think that's important. I mean, he has a better story to tell than, than I do about law enforcement. I mean, he, he's been a part of, if you knew anything about him, he had a son who was bipolar who killed another police officer. I mean, that's got to be just terrible. But sure. he stood up and took on the mental health issue. And Dallas now is one of the leaders in the country because of David Brown, where they have a veteran who identifies themselves. They send literally a social worker and five police officers out and talk the guy out. So, Patrick, you talked a little bit about the country. Do you know how in a in a rodeo when the baddest bull throws the rider and goes to the other end and won't come back and all the cowboys can't get him and they lasso him, but the horses can't get that big bull back? How do yeah. they get that bull back in the pen? The the clown, the rodeo clowns. 
No, they fail too. What they do is they let six of the other steers loose and they run down there and they get him and bring him back. And this is what they do. They surround the person that's in trouble. Instead of just saying you're a criminal, they actually treat him because we have veterans that are police officers and they put down their weapons and they talk to them as, as a, a, a peer and they relate to them that way. And if that. a person gives that ability, just like the bull at the other end of the ring, they come back and we could give, and I'm going to use the word love and care. And like we've it. got to get back to this. I agree. And, and we're doing it because of that David Brown who did through creative policing because he was given that opportunity and then out of success, the other side didn't like it. So they got rid of him. So live and learn. Yeah. Look, I, I have nothing but respect for law enforcement. My whole family and friends know that there's no question um, about that. Look, I'm a, I'm a weird liberal. I'm, I, I'm, I'm pro gun. You know, first of all, I think people should have guns because I grew up in Texas. I know people can be co uh, competent gun owners and I don't think that's really uh, comes down to the issue, you know, but at the same time, again, I've lived all over the place. So I have different beliefs and thoughts and my things kind of junk together. I don't even know if I would say I'm a Democrat or Republican, like a lot of Americans, just, you know, ask me the issue and I'll sort of tell you uh, where I stand. My father was conservative his whole life, voted Republican up until the day uh, he died. Rest in peace uh, to my father. You know, so it, it really just comes down to the issue and what's happening and how I feel in that moment about the person as, as well is, is really well, what it comes I, down I, to. I want to openly say to you, I'd like to take time on the air and talk with you about any issue you've got and invite you to be able to openly say, you see, and I'm not saying you have said anything different sure. to see sure. both sides and to give my party a chance. I'd like to invite you to, 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 to listen to my party. I'd like to give you our leading edge ideas. I'd like for you to feel good about saying, wow, the Republican party has the best ideas in healthcare. <laughs> I'd like for you to say, the, <laughs> but I've already pitched them to you. And sure. the other side is you got to go and be in the system where, where you sit out in the hall. And, yeah. and that you see, their system didn't give you a doctor. Yeah. Um, and you this know, way, I, I don't know. you have an insurance program that gives you a doctor. So I just think the more this seeps in, and I'm willing to take time with you. And but I just appreciate you giving me the time to, to no, pitch Pete, I, our ideas. I, I appreciate you um, again, just being willing and open to talk and, and have a conversation about this stuff. It's really important to me. I think like a lot of people, you know, who listen to the show know it's we're all about learning new things on the show and hearing people out and listening to them. And then from there, you make your own decision. That That's that's what I you know, we probably agree on the media, you know, in that sense, I wish the media did that more and just provide information and let us make decisions because we're not all going to make the best decision. I'm never going to say the Democratic Party makes all the right decisions. And I would never say the Republic Party makes all the right decisions. You know, I mean, I just would never say that, um, you know, again, something that turns me off from conservative is when I hear Christian conservative values when i hear that term and i've seen you use that term as well and that that worries me a little bit just because i'm not a christian so how is somebody going to say christian values in in politics like i want to keep that out of politics now i believe in freedom of religion my mother's catholic she's all day long to jesus and god and she hits me with holy water at every waking moment uh, so i'm all about people believing whatever they want but my problem is when it starts to become how, how can i get behind that if i'm not a christian Right. That, that well, worries me. I'll tell you how you can get behind it, because we really talk about faith. But I, I will just say this. Uh, and and uh, I'm I'm an older guy. When you are confronted with things that you've been confronted with, it uh, it gives me a way to understand them and to see them with the clarity. If you knew more about me and some of the things which I harbor in with family and things like that, who have severe medical conditions, uh, I, it gives me a way to deal with it and to, 
to move it forward. And I, Absolutely. that's why I go to church every Sunday sure. because I'm there for other people because I believe, I mean, I, I, let me just put it this way too. You know, I'm an Eagle scout. Yeah. You, you know, you may know, you probably don't. I, I actually at about the age of 16 was in New Mexico at about 10,500 feet in this great big field with other 16 year olds. And we looked up and saw the heavens and you don't have to be a Christian. I think you do have to say, how did this happen? Sure. And the most logical yes. answer to me is something or some something created this. I get and, it. And I, I just chose to go the way of, I believe some, there is order to our life. There is order and meaning and purpose in the, and, and, and knowledge and, and, and inquisitive behavior. I mean, I'm all for us going to the moon and going to these places and learning because we want to learn, but also believe that we have to respect mother nature and sure. we have to respect uh, other people who are struggling in life. And the way I do that is through the kindness of, of being able to tell people I love them and saying with sincere appreciation to those who, whether it's, you know, down in, in Brazil, I'm just as concerned about them burning the Amazon. I'm just as concerned about the proper way, but we kind of seemingly disagree with how we save wildlife in Africa. And the bottom line is, is that if we don't have conservation programs there, they'll slaughter every one of those uh, lions and, 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 and the gazelle and the gazelles will be gone too because they'll shoot all of that. But if we manage it, then, then, then everybody survives. So yeah, it's yeah. hard. And, and, sure. and, you know, then it gets into global warming. I'm an Eagle scout. I learned what proper, uh, you know, healthy force is a long time ago. You don't allow these things to burn out of control. And Patrick, you were probably a very young man and don't remember Yellowstone burning down. Yellowstone burned down because the, the forest service, I'm not here to take them on, but the way I understand it is that that was the top job to have and that those people did not practice healthy forest. And so all the, all the land there, uh, the fuel, and the land, once there was a, a lightning strike, it burned up Yellowstone. And because all the fuel was on the ground, they couldn't stop it. 500,000 animals died in that. But oh, if you practice horrific. healthy forest, you know, to clean the, floors, the, the forest floor where it doesn't burn up and become so hot that, that it burns everything. So there's balance. Huh. So I, I sure. preach balance too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, I, I'm all about it. Um, I think that's great. I think um, I think it's great that you found that that stuff in your life, and it's for you. And again, I'm I'm all about it. It's not. I actually was a a Baptist for three years, if you can believe it. When I was 18. I got baptized. I, I was like, oh yeah, I'm in. I, this is it. I believe it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do. That. I so I dedicated three four years of my life hardcore to it. You know, I taught Sunday school. I I led worship. I sang songs for college age. I I was all into it. Um, you know, so. I get it. I, I understand that there's something the search has not even ended for me either. So I'm with you. I, I understand it. And I think it's it's just I'm all about the freedom of it. I respect anybody's uh, position, to, to be frank with so, you. And so honestly, let me say this. I want to hear party, it. My party is for faith. Uh, I, I, look, I get it. I get it. So I get when it. we say Christian, uh, we, we and I say that, too. I mean, heck, I'm a darn Methodist. Yeah, <laughs> you know the Baptist. The Baptists kind of look at Methodists and say, "Oh, you guys aren't real." You know, so I, I, I mean, I, I think, I think, in fairness, while there may be jokes, uh, faith, faith, sure. and I, so I'd like to pitch to you, Patrick. My party is strong into faith, and that is that we can tell each other we love each other, and we're not in this as individuals, and we need to all be together. So. I like that. All right. That's a good message. That, yeah. Who can't get behind that? I, I like that for sure. Um, well, look, that seems like a good place to, to end a nice positive note. Um, you know, and of course, everyone needs to go out and vote, uh, make your voice 
heard, that's something we can all get behind, right? We can all uh, get behind getting people out to vote and get their voice heard. Um, so, uh, well, but I again, I did uh, well enough to get invited back. Are you kidding me? This was amazing. I, I truly enjoyed uh, this conversation. You know, I talked to I don't know if you know who Connie Burton is, but I talked to her last week and I had just the best conversation with her. Um, she was a Senate Republican here and in, in, um, worked out of North Austin Texas. here. Yeah, not in North Texas, but she said she lived here in Austin and we were talking about that. Yeah, had a had a great time with her. Um, no, Mr. Sessions, I absolutely enjoyed uh, this conversation. It was really great to hear uh, where you stand on things and, and how you feel about things. And I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this episode. So Good. I'm excited. So, Patrick, next time, let's take the time and, and, and take any calls that we want. Uh, although I think you do. I think you do a great job of, of not only moderating, but attempting to delve in to ask further questions. I just want you to know I'm dedicated uh, to discussing and trying to get things better. And I, we, we, we owe that to each other. So thank you very much. Love that. Love that. Th- no, thank you so much. I uh, really do appreciate it. And, you know, my best to you and your staff and your family uh, during all this time. And uh, good luck with everything. And, and yeah, absolutely. We'll have you on again. We'll do this again. Love the idea of fan questions. That's a great idea. So I appreciate great. your openness to that. So yes, thank sir. you again. My best to you yes, all. Sir. And uh, thank you be safe out there. Yes, thank sir. You. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more. We're using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Until next time.